Good morning or afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the How to Reduce Risk from Exploit Kits and Ransomware in K-12 webcast. We are glad to have you with us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you entered the WebEx console, you either joined us via audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. You'll remain muted throughout the event. We'll be using written Q&A during today's event. To ask a question at any time, please enter your question in the WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. You can find the Q&A panel at the bottom right hand of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication to our WebEx facilitators for problems or issues you may be experiencing. Again, please enter your questions for our speakers in the WebEx Q&A panel. We would appreciate your input regarding today's webcast. A short survey will pop up when you close your browser at the end of the event. Today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing at any time over the next 90 days. Each participant will receive an email that includes a link to access the recording. At this time, I'd like to introduce Matt Gibbs. Matt, I will turn the program over to you. Thanks, Bethany. My name is Matt Gibbs. I'm a solutions architect on Cisco's uh, US public sector team. And I'm gonna start by going through some of the unique challenges that we see in the K-12 environment um, and then my colleague Joey is going to go over uh, a particularly nasty uh, type of malware that, that we're just seeing more and more of called ransomware, including how to uh, address this risk. Joey, can you share your screen? I should be sharing. Uh, let me do it now. Share desktop. Okay. Very good. Can you see? Yep, thank you, perfect. Perfect, go ahead and advance to the, to the next slide. Okay, so what are some of the things that we see in K-12? Well, we have this amazing ubiquitous connectivity and, and we've seen this just grow you know, year over year. And a lot of that is due to the desire and, and really the need to include technology in day-to-day in -day learning experiences, right? And part of the challenge is because that connectivity is, is becoming more and more ubiquitous, and in a lot of cases, what we have are you know, very fast internet pipes, in a lot of cases subsidized through you know, something like the E-rate program, but there aren't always the budgets commensurate with that really fast pipe to the internet to protect and secure the students behind that connection and, and the traffic going over that connection. And to exacerbate the problem, there's a number of initiatives that, that happen uh, where the, the need and the demand on that internet connection only grows. And so if you have something like a one-on-one -on -one initiative where you're assigning tablets and netbooks and, and laptops to students, uh, more and more that connectivity becomes really a critical part of, of the day-to-day -day learning experience. And because of that, if, if that information or access is, uh, is lost or slowed down or, or otherwise hampered, it, it can really cause some major problems. Uh, just in, in the day in, day out, you know, business you all are in of, of educating your students. Um, E-rate has some of its own special challenges in terms of SIPA and FERPA and some of the regulations that apply to, to qualifying for funds. We're certainly seeing a, a huge increase in uh, digital learning, and, and because of that, we're re relying a lot more and more on technology. And again, when that technology is unavailable, um, and Joey's going to talk about some of the ways that that, uh, that information can become unavailable through ransomware, if and when that happens, it can really have a, a very negative impact. We're also seeing the growth of computer science as a trend in, in the K-12 environment. And what that means is, you know, for the first time, uh, more and more, you're really starting to see a level of education and familiarity uh, by students with technology and using technology. And in a lot of cases, that's a level of understanding that teachers and staff don't necessarily share. And to make matters worse, you have this culture that's growing within, especially the younger student population, where they expect to be able to share and access information in, in, a, in a free manner. 
Uh, and, and so some of those attitudes towards information may be very different between sort of what students expect, especially younger students, and what teachers and staff and administrators expect, and in a lot of cases are, are expected by the federal government to provide security. Uh, and, and of course, we always have this constant pace of change. Technology is a great example of, of sort of that, that onward march towards uh, bigger and better things, but obviously we need to balance that with awareness, we need to be able to mitigate risk, we need to have an understanding of what some of these risks are and, and how to address them. A couple other areas that we see in the K-12 environment that are, are fairly unique, there probably isn't a, a K-12 school or, or district out there that doesn't provide some sort of guest access, right? This is a, an open door that, that anyone can use to access potentially information on your network, but also use your network to, uh, you know, often launch attacks and, and access information on the internet. You know, what would you imagine is sort of the, the biggest, uh, you know, goal of, of an attacker? Is it to go after like a large organization, like a, like a giant school district? Not as often. In, in a lot of cases, what we see is they're very interested in, in smaller school districts because in, in some cases they make an easier target and the, the level of awareness sort of within those environments isn't necessarily at the same level as a really large school district, maybe with a dedicated security uh, technician or, or even team, right? And so besides needing to protect access to your own information, you wanna make sure that you're a good network citizen to, to other institutions and organizations that, that you interact with, as well as the general internet. And then finally, the, the growing use of cloud services really means, again, that our reliance on technology becomes more and more critical day in, day out. Next slide, please. And so why, you know, why are students such a desirable target for attackers? Well, it turns out that unused social security numbers, uh, a clean or, or even in most cases, no credit history at all, uh, that's a gold mine for attackers because they can use that to perpetuate identity fraud. Uh, and in doing so, have access to a record that is extremely difficult for you know, financial institutions to verify. It's one thing where you have a lot of information or even a clean credit history there's information there that you can use to verify is this a legitimate, you know, application for a loan or, or credit or something like that versus not. But what if that credit report is, is virtually empty? There's nothing to verify. And so in a lot of cases, uh, those are the types of records that attackers are looking for. Uh, and, and as it happens, a study that, that came out a couple of years ago indicated that in the US, one in 40 families had at least one family member, 18 or under, who had their personal identifiable information stolen uh, and used for identity fraud. So this is a, an ever-growing problem, you know, and, and so that's the risk, right? And then you also have the pressure of, of CIPA and FERPA, these mandates that, that say you must protect the student from the internet, you must protect their personally identifiable information. Next slide. And so there's obviously a, a lot of risks out there as it relates to cybersecurity. Today we're gonna to talk specifically about ransomware. And here's just a, a handful of, of uh, students, uh, sorry, school districts that, that have been hit by this, you know, this particularly nasty uh, type of attack in malware. You know, you can see over the last year or so, um, Park exams in New Jersey were, were delayed, you know, lessons plan, lesson plans lost, data lost. In some cases, school districts opted to, to pay the ransom, which is not necessarily what, what we recommend, but in some cases they are, you know, really held, <laughs> ransom is the perfect word because what do they do? That's critical information. And if they haven't done some of the things that, that Joey's going to talk about, in, in a lot of cases, you may find yourself in, in a position where you feel like you don't really have any other choice, right? And so what are, the, what are the key things to think about here? Technology is becoming more and more ubiquitous and more and more critical 
to your day-to-day -day operations and your day-to-day -day mission of, of educating students to the point that if that information becomes unavailable, what are you gonna do? Do you have a backup? Are you gonna pay the ransom? These are some of the things that, that Joey is going to talk about. Next slide, please. So the K-12 environment is a complicated one. There's a number of elements that, that don't generally exist in other types of organizations. You have a learning environment with, with a population of, of students that may have a higher level of understanding of technology than the, you know, the teachers that are, that are teaching it or, or using it on a day-to-day -day basis. You want to be able to provide relatively, you know, open educational access, but at the same time provide a level of security and lock down those environments, you know, both to meet the mandates and, and to just provide best practices and to follow best practices from a security perspective. You have guest networks where you may have people signing in at the front office and, and really securing your school from a physical security perspective, right? But the guest access is wide open and all someone needs to do is is glance at a piece of paper and, and they're on your network all of a sudden. Uh, and, we're, and more and more we're seeing the use of, you know, online schedules, exams, learning management systems. This technology, w whereas maybe 10 plus years ago was something that folks were starting to look at, today is becoming more and more really a critical aspect uh, of your day-to-day -day educational operations. And finally, uh, another trend we're seeing more and more is be because now you have these systems that are available inside the school, sometimes even via the internet with cloud services, you want to be able to access that information remotely as well, right? So now there's another potential avenue in inside the school environment to take advantage of information, potentially ha have some malware infect some systems, you know, and maybe it's ransomware and maybe it locks down that system and, and now what do you do? And so that's where my colleague Joey is, is going to take over. He's going to explain uh, all of these, these challenges and sort of what malware is, how it works. And he's going to, going to provide some really critical advice about how to protect yourself against malware. Joey? Great. Appreciate it. Okay. So Matt gave us an overview of the K-12 through environment. The second part of this is going to be particularly around the, uh, the topic at hand, which is ransomware. Now, with the topic of ransomware, there's a few things to note that we call this uh, ransomware exploit kits. We had those two terms in there. Um, exploit kits, I'll cover in a few minutes, are part of it, the problem. They're typically the, the tool used to deliver ransomware. But in the news, you may hear exploit kit, you may hear ransomware, you may hear the actual attacks, so like SAM SAM or Locky, which are variations of ransomware. Uh, you may hear Angular, which is a type of exploit kit. But in general, we're seeing a lot of press and a lot of news around this topic. Um, as Matt kind of alluded to, the, uh, the concept behind this topic is, uh, in some form or fashion, the end result is uh, your students or your servers or your personal devices are basically being compromised, your data is being encrypted, and then they're charging a ransom. So they're holding your data for ransom, and typically three, four hundred dollars cash, and you can buy back your data supposedly, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. Now, as I mentioned, uh, ransomware is the end result. So ransomware doesn't magically just appear on your system. It's got to get there. Like It's got to be delivered. And a very common way to do that is through exploit kits, hence why this webinar was titled Exploit Kits and Ransomware. Now, uh, there's many forms of exploit kits, but to kind of generalize a web version of it, there's typically three stages of this attack. And the, the three stages are stage one is um, the idea of trying to get you to go to a bad place. Stage two is getting you on that bad place and then finding a, a vulnerability or weakness. And then stage three is uh, using that vulnerability to place the ransomware on your computer. Um, to kind of give you an example of stage one, this is like an example of just a general phishing email that I received in Gmail. But basically, it can be a, hey, click this link because you won something, or around Christmas time, hey, you got a package, 
and uh, please click this to track it. And you'll say, oh, well, uh, I bought a bunch of stuff for Christmas. Maybe this is one of my packages, and you click the link. So the idea is, is get you to click the link so you end up going to the bad place. Now, email is one way to get you to go to the bad place. Uh, another way can be that you're just surfing looking for free Olympic videos or free fantasy football stats. And when you go to a site and you see that kind of thing shoot across the screen, that's a landing page. That's basically uh, what, uh, trying to fish you to get you to go to this site, uh, luring you in by offering you something for free. And then when you end up on a page, you end up on the bad spot. So there's, there's that approach. Um, another approach is called malvertising, which is what's being shown here. And that's where the attackers compromise like a WordPress site or an advertisement firm. So you go to a trusted site, but an advertisement pops up, and uh, it could be a shoe advertisement, whatever it is, and that advertisement will take you to the bad site. So you're just on Facebook, and unfortunately a link or a video that's playing is also going to send you someplace bad. That's called an advertisement. So, you know, stage one is get you to go to the bad spot. Stage two, you get exploited. Stage three, ransomware ends up on your computer. Now, the key thing is, think of like a phone. The reason why this is such a problem, this whole exploit kit concept is, that kit, which the end result is delivering ransomware, is a rental service. So like with a phone, we all know how to use a phone, but most of us can't build a phone. Like if you give me the parts, I can't construct a phone, but obviously I can make phone calls. With this exploit kit concept, it's very similar in nature, where there's a lot of complicated things happening here, but as an attacker, I can rent this space and they'll give me the link, they'll give me this basically the kit to deliver the ransomware, so I don't have to necessarily understand all the complexities, I just know how to point and click and make this happen. So exploit, exploit kits have made ransomware and made these attacks much easier to deliver, hence why we're seeing more of it on the, on the web. So think about like an Amazon rental service, but now it's a kind of evil exploit kit service that you can rent. That's web. We see exploit kits uh, as one example, but general email is another attack vector. So like Locky and I think it's called Zooks is like a new version of Locky. Uh, those are typically email based where you get an email, you open the email and you get exploited. So email and web typically are the two top areas, but there are others. Sam Sam, for example, is not either of these. That's looking for vulnerable JBall servers. Um, so there's many variations, but the most common one is typically web or email. The end result, when the ransomware hits your computer is, you get the uh, welcome, hey, your, uh, your stuff's encrypted, and pay the ransom. Now, a couple things to note. One, they don't typically make your computer not work anymore. So, like, they won't go after your system 32 files and all that because they want you to be able to pay the ransom. So by harming your system, that would kind of defeat that purpose. Two, we've noticed that they are attacking, like, the U.S. and Europe. So there's certain uh, countries where they'll look at the origin and they'll say, hey, you're in the UK or, you, or, or Ukraine or you're in Russia, and it'll actually decrypt and won't work on those systems. The belief is that uh, those countries, they have uh, heavy penalties if you attack your own citizens, but uh, less penalties if you attack other countries. So by design, the ransomware actually identifies where you're located, and based on that, it will either encrypt or decrypt. Um, so there's a lot of little other things around how this works, but the general goal is encrypt just your actual data files that you care about and hold that for ransom. Looking at uh, Angular as an example, which is one exploit kit, and there's many others. There's Rig, there's many others, but our, our research team, Talos, so Talos does like, they power our security products as well as research and, and stop bad guys, that's what they do at Cisco Talos. They did a post on just this Angular exploit kit, and they showed these numbers, which they were saying, looking at the numbers, basically 2.9% of people paying approximately a $300 ransomware with approximately 9,500 people a month paying, these exploit kits, this is just one Angular exploit kit, is approximately generating about $34 million a year. Now, think about that. $34 million a year for just one of these exploit kits means A, you're going to see a lot more of this because they have a great amount of R&B. I assure you they have Cisco, Palo Alto, FireEye, you name it, in their labs. And as they innovate, they have a great R&D budget to do so. The second thing is that more people are going to want to do this because it's lucrative, as shown here. And then as I explained, if it's easy to do and lucrative, it just it makes it a, a growing business. 
And that's why this problem continues to grow. Now, ransomware hasn't been around, or has been around for like over 10 years. It's nothing new. There's just been a lot of, uh, of evolutions, a lot of updates that have made it a recent problem. Uh, some of those updates, because again, it's been around 10 years, but years ago, we were able to blacklist the attackers. Things like Tor, for example, have made it harder for Cisco and other uh, defenders to identify who the attackers are because they're in that hidden network, they're in that dark network, so it makes it difficult and challenging for us to identify the attackers. Uh, currency has, has been a, a game changer. In the past, we can track when you pay where the money's going. Now they require Bitcoins, and Bitcoins is a digital currency, makes it tough for us to track. So Bitcoins have changed the game. Exploit kits, exploit kits have changed the game, as explained earlier. It makes it easier to deliver the ransomware. So now people don't have to understand all the details. They can just rent this space and deliver the ransomware. So those are some, some innovations that have made ransomware more popular, and that's why we're seeing more of it. To give you some future predictions, this is the Matt, Joey, Cisco kind of crystal ball future predictions, things that we're seeing recently that are probably going to grow into a more trend-based ransomware are, one, in the past, ransomware uh, providers didn't really talk to you. They didn't care about you. So they would say $300, $400. I don't care if you're John Chambers or Chuck Robbins, CEO of Cisco, or if you're an admin, three, $400, pay and move on. With recent ransomware like SamSam, they're starting to communicate to with us. And that's scary as hell. And the reason why is they're doing things like, hi, hey, you're with Cisco. Here's one free uh, decryption. By the way, we, you have 70 devices. Why don't I charge you a Costco or a bigger key? So for like $40,000, we'll give you one key to, to unencrypt all those devices. And why that's scary is, is, is one, now they're starting to understand I'm owning a network. I can do more with this than three, $400 which means the other prediction is not only we're we gonna see more communication, but we're gonna see more lateral movement. Like the focus will be more on lateral movement because then they can laterally move, own your entire school, and then try to charge you for one major key versus individual keys. So we're starting to see it now. Uh, and when I say communicate, like we had our Talos guys say, hey, uh, in that message board from Sam Sam, uh, you hit me three months ago, can I have half off? And the attackers actually said, sure, yes, and charge $150. So again, these are real people communicating with you, which is scary because that means now they're gonna start negotiating, and that also means they're gonna start uh, putting more focus on that lateral movement. So again, we're seeing some of it now. The prediction is that's gonna be more trends that we'll see in future ransomware attacks. Now, last concept on ransomware to point out is, people ask, should I pay? Honestly, I'm gonna tell you, please don't, because you're, you're part of that $34 million. You're funding them to basically get stronger. Uh, so that's the first reason not to pay. But the second is, is this. Uh, there's been a lot of ransomware coming out re uh, recently that uh, our Talos Research Group calls RANSCAM. And you can uh, Google RANSCAM, you can see our Talos blog on this. But the idea is, is they're not gonna give your data back. So when you click the payment button, they're deleting your data anyways. How this ransomware works, it actually doesn't encrypt your hard drive, it just deletes your hard drive. So regardless, you're done. Like, payment doesn't do anything. So two, if you pay, don't pay because you may not even get your data back. And then three, you may get your data back, but they may, now that they're starting to negotiate and do the lateral movement, you may get your data back plus a bonus, meaning you may get back like some uh, components to help them laterally move, they may modify your data. You don't know necessarily what you're getting back. So rather than like having budgets to pay this ransom, the best practice is don't pay the ransom and proactively think about security, such as attending today's webinar, uh, and do these things. That's a general overview. Obviously, I can go deep into ransomware and exploit kits. That's just some general pointers. But let's talk about defending. And by all means, if there's other questions, uh, feel free to uh, post. I've seen some posts already coming up. But post your questions, and at the end of this, we'll have time. We can go deeper if you've experienced ransomware, you've experienced uh, exploit kits, and you want to ask us. You have the experts here. We can we can address deeper questions after uh, we finish uh, today's webinar. So defense. What can you do? First off, the best practice. This is general best practice. Is know your network, and what that means is a lot of these ransomware attacks. 
they're, they're using known vulnerabilities. So in a lot of cases, it's not using like some day zero purchase off of the dark net. A lot of cases, they'll find uh, a weakness that is known and exploit it. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, there was one use case where Microsoft uh, was doing the Office 10 updates, the, and it was a rolling update. So they didn't just give everybody the update. You had to be invited. And then they would say, all right, it's your turn. You'll get an email, and you'll get the update. Well, these uh, attackers saw that email and then basically cloned it and started getting in front of Microsoft, just emailing people saying, hey, it's your turn for the update. Download this. And when you download it, you got ransomware. So it's an example of a tactic. Uh, a lot of cases, it's known vulnerabilities in Flash and Java where they'll find this vulnerability and assume that you haven't patched the system and use that for the attack. So identifying your weaknesses, knowing your vulnerabilities will help you uh, reduce the risk. Segmentation is important. So if you do get owned, the goal would be is to not let that cr crawl across your network. So things like proper segmentation will contain if you get owned. Education is important. Uh, things like don't click, the whole phishing concept. We do it at Cisco. It's called Fish Me, where we'll constantly fish each other. And if you click the wrong link, uh, you'll end up on the wall of shame. But it's a good learning process. It scares people into to thinking about those emails versus just clicking things. Assessments are great. Uh, you're not only assessing yourself, but a professional assessment, which, by the way, at Cisco, uh, we do offer that. We offer incident response, assessment services, et cetera. So we could help you there if you don't have those skills. And then most importantly is backup. I mean, in the end, if your data gets encrypted and you have a backup, at least you can go to your backup. If your backup gets encrypted, you'll have challenges. And by all means, please put your backup on a different network segment. So segmentation and backup goes hand in hand. Because if it's not, then it's a possibility they'll laterally move to your backup. And then what was the point of having the backup? Now, that's this general best practice. Some of the Cisco things we're going to talk about is, is looking at the entire attack. A lot of people come up to me, a lot of people come up to Matt and say, I need a new firewall or I need this product, and they don't actually think about what they're actually defending. And in this use case with ransomware, you're not just defending ransomware, you're defending how the ransomware gets onto your network. So basically the strategy is our before, during, and after strategy, which is first addressing how bad guys are going to try to attack you and limit so like everybody can't attack you. So that's before. So an example would be, don't let me be able to light up a server and immediately start attacking you. My website has to be online. It has to have a good credit score before I can communicate with you. During would be the attack. Are you able to stop, if you end up on the landing page, somebody from exploiting you? And after is not blocking. After is actually assuming that you will get owned and then having something that you can do about it versus, oh, I'm owned, and then just giving up. So technologies. And the before phase are things like firewall, VPNing. These technologies, if they have credit scoring and they have DNS security, these are going to basically limit uh, who can communicate with you. Where your during phase would be like your IPS, your antivirus. These will stop when you get to the landing page and they look for that vulnerability. These ideally are going to stop that. But these aren't 100%. They're signature based in most cases, and something may get through, and that's the after technologies which is file and behavior, and I'll talk about this shortly. But these are designed for when I get breached, when a vulnerability is exploited, detect that an exploit has happened, detect I've been owned, and do something about that. So these are some industry terms that kind of lay out what, what a before, during, and after strategy is. Now, let's apply this to a ransomware exploit attack. Back to the attack, the before phase would be stopping the redirection. So if a student clicks a link, a student surfs to a website, uh, a student goes to Facebook and a, or a WordPress site and the advertiser tries to send them to the bad site, will your defenses stop that? That's the question here. Our recommendation first will be DNS security. So open DNS, which we offer, uh, or just general DNS security is a good first layer because that's when you go to a website or you click a link or do something, the translation is the first thing that happens. And if you can stop the redirection to the landing page there, you stop the attack. By the way, as you can see here, it's free for home use. So at the very least, please uh, take a screenshot. I'll, I'll leave it up for a second here. Uh, it's a YouTube video I created. It's free to do this for home. You get free content filtering and free DNS security. So at least you can protect your friends and family. And then to bring this to the school, 
there's an umbrella license you can do to basically bring the same security to your business. So open DNS is a good first layer. Another one is our security products in general, like our Firepower, our WSA, pretty much anything that has web content filtering, not only blocks porn and gambling and that kind of stuff, but we also look at the credit score of the website. So if like, for example, there's somebody says they're a bank, but they're hosted from GoDaddy, uh, from another country, they've been online for two hours, they've only hit data to like your school, for example, or to like five schools, those are indications that that site is actually not what it is, and reputation security can stop that attack. So the idea with reputation security is, is also like OpenDNS, but this is a functionality within other security products like Firepower, you're, you're not letting everybody be able to attack you. And again, if I, as an attacker, typically I would light up a cloud server, launch my attack, and then bring the cloud server down. If that cloud server is going through this, that won't work anymore. I'm gonna to have to actually own another school and then attack you from that school, which is a lot more work because that other school has a good credit score. So you're making it harder for the attackers to, to attack you. So that's the first layer, that's the idea of before. During is, is, is what happens when you do click the link or you go to the bad site and then basically this, this landing page is trying to find a vulnerability on your system. Now again, best practices, in most cases, are looking for known threats. So your patch management, your software updates, your education, these are things that reduce the risk of basically them finding that right exploit to be able to drop the ransomware on your computer. But it's not 100%. And the one thing that you, you need to do is, is think about also your tools. And this is where we find a lot of weakness, meaning people will buy antivirus, they'll buy IPS, and they'll set it to auto updates, and they set it and forget it. Now understand this. IPS 101, um, there's basic IPSs and there's enterprise IPSs. And with basic ones, you hit green light and you can't tune it. Enterprise ones, you can tune. Now, in either case, if you don't tune an IPS, I, me at Cisco here in my, in my house in DC, there's no way I can possibly know about your vulnerabilities in your network. I can push down with that update, look out for shell shock, heart bleed, drown. I can give you the industry bad stuff, but I can't tell that little Timmy brought on a laptop and that laptop hasn't been patched in forever. I, I, I can't tell that, I'm just a vendor. I, there's no way I can know your network. So to make these products more effective, you need to tune it for your environment. Tuning in our world can be automated. In our world, we have a built-in vulnerability scanner. So this is our firepower stuff. We'll actually scan your network for vulnerabilities. We'll notice little Timmy's laptop is missing a, a update and it's vulnerable to attack we will then apply the associated patch, which also we see application, we see where they're surfing, so we'll see little Timmy surfing and the possible Java uh, exploit, and we'll actually, it's called uh, Firepower Recommendations, we will auto-tune that for you, so auto-adapt. Because keep in mind, of, like an appliance, like if this was an IPS, this would only be able to store maybe 40, 50,000 signatures turned on, and that's it. I can't turn everything on, there's, there's too many vulnerabilities, You'll, you'll kill the, the IPS, you'll turn it into a brick. So the name of the game is, is, is adjusting your security for your environment, and one key differentiator that we do is we auto-tune it. But if you don't have our technology, by all means, please at least tune your IPS. Don't just auto-update and that's it. If you're doing that, most likely you have gaps, and those gaps is what's gonna cause you to get ransomware on your, your endpoints. Now, lastly, again, it's no, if any vendor promises 100% block, they're lying to you. There's always a way to get around. And that's where you need to prepare for the after phase. You need to assume that somebody's gonna click the wrong thing, somebody's gonna plug in a USB key, whatever it is, and a, a threat like malware or ransomware is gonna end up on your endpoints. And that's the after phase. Which by the way, if you don't have an after phase, how do you know how effective your before and during is? You can say I have the greatest firewall ever and greatest IPS, but if nothing's validating it to see if something got through, how do you know? In our world, we recommend a network and endpoint approach, uh, both using files and, and, uh, and uh, network traffic. So to talk about this, the network traffic approach would be turning your routers or switches, turning your network into security sensors. So you, we all have routers, we all have switches, giving them the capability of detecting insider threats. You can do this with NetFlow, and the technology is called StealthWatch. And the idea behind this is, is looking for basically the canary in the coal mine. 
You're looking for things like why is for the first time traffic looking this way, lateral movement, port scans, reconnaissance. Uh, to make this kind of like a, a human factor, think about like if you notice a colleague and for the first time they're taking all their corporate email and sending it all to their personal email account. Think about that. What would that mean? If I saw Matt, for example, I walked by his office and he's dumping his, his Cisco email to his Gmail, what's going on? I would probably think that Matt's possibly leaving Cisco. Hopefully not, but I would possibly think he's leaving Cisco. Now, that's authorized. I'm allowed at Cisco to send my email from Cisco to Gmail. Nothing's stopping that, but that's weird. That's a canary in the coal mine scenario. And that's the same idea from a security perspective. We're looking for that weirdness, and we're looking for it through your regular network devices. And with ransomware, it would be the lateral movement. It would be the, the, the reverse shell out the network. It would be that communication, depending on the type of ransomware, it trying to phone out to get the, the key handshake to do the encryption. These are things we're looking for from a network perspective to try to identify the threat. That's network. The other best practice is file, meaning files are like the tools bad guys use. Uh, think about like a plumber brings his tools to work, bad guys use malware. And in this case, that malware is ransomware. So to detect that, you need not antivirus, because antivirus is a signature-based detection. You need a non-signature behavior-based detection, which is what advanced malware protection, or AMP, is. And that also, by the way, comes with firepower. So just to kind of talk about it from a technology and Cisco perspective, URL license is the before, IPS is the during, AMP, advanced malware protection, is this license, the after. And with this, again, we're analyzing every file. And to show you what I mean, I work for Cisco, so I am the family help desk guy. My, my uncles, my aunts, everybody, uh, they call me when they have technology problems. And I have my Aunt Donna, and if you've heard me talk before, I talk about her because I purposely do not uh, help her other than putting AMP on her computer. So her and my mom are actually the two that have AMP and constantly get hit with stuff because they're just, they're lazy. They won't update their system. Windows will say, update me, they'll say, ignore. Java will say, update me, they'll say, ignore. And to me, it's great because I let them get infected and I can see the fun data on their computers. Now, this is from a few months back, but here's my mom, happy computing. Luckily, nothing this particular day, but my Aunt Donna, who's Donna PC, as you can see here, she has a very high level 10, one to 10, level 10 of severity vulnerability. It's a flash vulnerability. And I'm sure she's seen the update. I'm sure she said ignore. And as I mentioned, exploit kits love flash vulnerabilities. If she gets redirected to a exploit kit page and it sees this vulnerability, this is what will be used to put ransomware on her laptop. And so and behold, that happened one day. Up here is a screenshot where AMP said, hey, I saw a file come onto this computer through this, this exploit, and basically this file tried to do these things. This file is not what it is because it tried to delete a few things and tried to encrypt the hard drive. It was talking Spanish, and I'm Muniz, so I don't know if it saw that or just talk Spanish in general, but it did things that a EXE shouldn't do. And what's cool is not only was the file quarantined, but when I, I went to AMP and said, show me the file, this video I'm playing now, I literally was able to go to her PC in Florida, and I'm in, I'm in DC, rip that file off her computer, and run it in a sandbox to see what the file would have done. This is the video of that file that was dropped. So she literally went to some website, this file was placed, it was quarantined, but if it wasn't quarantined, this would have happened, which would have been a lawful conversation, which is your, your hard drive's encrypted. You can see it's CryptoLocker version three, because this is, again, a few months back, we're now on CryptoLocker 4, but basically this is the actual file that tried to execute on my aunt's uh, computer, and luckily AMP saw that weirdness, saw, again, these, these behaviors, and said, nope, this is not a, an actual file, and stopped it. So again, that's called advanced malware protection. So that's a summary of the before, during, and after, and this can apply to other aspects. You know, looking at email, before would be, can everybody send you email, or does your email security solution look at the reputation of who's sending email. Same kind of concept, during is scanning your email, after would be having like an AMP, having something to look at what files are coming through and making sure they're legit, as well as some kind of network technology like NetFlow Stealthwatch, where if, the, if you do get owned, you start to monitor to make sure that if weirdness happens, like that host starts doing weird network communication, you identify that. So to wrap up today's webinar, and then we'll go into question and answer, Best practices, not only 
knowing your network, but considering the entire attack. We talked about exploit kits and ransomware, and we talked about how ransomware doesn't magically appear. There's a, a process, and you need to look at that a process before, during, and after it happens. Honestly, people come to me all the time and say, Cisco, firewall, let's have a conversation. And what happens is they invest 60% or more of their investment in only like that firewall and that hardening of their network, and they don't think about the during and after phase. So my, my challenge to you, and I challenge you to do this, after today's webinar, get a whiteboard, and this is school, so you guys have lots of whiteboards, get a whiteboard right before, during, and after, and list out your security products. What is your firewall? What's your IPS? What's your SIM? What's your breach detection? And see where things fall. A lot of cases, when we do these workshops, and we can do it for you, you can go to Cisco and say, hey, let's do a, uh, a BDA before, during, and after workshop, and we will do this with you. But what you'll find is you'll find a lot of your investments are probably heavily in one area, and it's a gap. Like if you come to me and say, I want to buy a firewall, I'm going to ask, well, what about your during and after? And if you already have a firewall and you're just looking for a better firewall, I may say, well, it's great, but let's license and make sure the during and after phase is there. Because in the end, it's a, a, just having a during, like an antivirus, or just having a before, like a firewall, is not good enough. These attacks, they, they're, they're very strategic, and they're, they're very challenging to defend against because you may think, I got it via a web aspect, and then a new uh, vulnerability hits the street, or a new tactic like that, that Windows update where their social engineering hits the street. So there's many ways it's going to come at you, and the best practice is, is having a solid defense. Last recommendation will be we do have this ransomware page. So if you go to Cisco's ransomware uh, page, you can like Google Cisco ransomware and you'll find this. We have a lot of literature, a lot of best practices on here around dealing with ransomware, and we even have sales bundles. So there's bundles that I don't know when they're going to expire, but we can take together the technologies covered today and like in a discount bundle for small, medium, and large schools get you going as well. So that's kind of a summary of, of the concept of ransomware exploit kits in the market. Uh, we'll go ahead with our last uh, 15 minutes and open it up for, for questions, concerns, et cetera. Um, Matt, do you want to, I guess, look at the, the question panel or – how yep. do we kind of go through yeah, the list? Yeah, so folks can, can submit their questions through the question panel. We've already had a couple. Um, really good one about how backups are an extremely useful tool in terms of recovering from ransomware. Uh, but, you know, is there a good chance that the backup is compromised and how do you mitigate that? You know, I, I mentioned that obviously, as you said, Joey, you know, you really need to make sure that those backup systems are appropriately segmented from your production network. Right, and, and everyone, you know, remember the mantra, like network, you know, network file storage, that's not a backup. You want that data on some sort of removable device so you actually have like an air gap between, you know, your network and, and your backups. That's, that's why tapes are still a, a thing today, right? And so um, that's, that's a good way to do it. And, and also, as Joey walked through our before, during, after strategy, it really helps to have some systems in place that let you know exactly when and where on your network these potential compromises happen. So you can go back, look at that information, and make informed decisions about which backups you actually need to, to go to, right? Because there is always the possibility that at some point there is a backup of encrypted files somewhere, right? Because your backups are going to continue operating. You need to know when that compromise happened so you can go to the right backup. Joey, anything else you'd, you'd add to that? Yeah, that, that's, that's it, man. I mean, with, with, when it comes to backups, you want to handle it all on a different network so it, the ransomware can't spread there. That's, that's the key thing. And, um, yeah, the, the security and segmentation in general. So when, if you do get owned, um, you can definitely contain it. The last thing would be is, is also testing your response, your incident response plan. Absolutely. Best practice for incident response is, uh, is scope, contain, and remediate. Scope means being able to actually realize how bad things are. Contain is be able to not let it spread any further. If you can't scope and contain it, you're never going to remediate. And we see that happen a lot where people can't scope and contain, so they start playing whack-a-mole, and eventually the threat ends up on their backup server. So That's make right. sure as well, look at, look at your incident response plan. Can you scope, contain, and remediate uh, these threats? And, and how would you react? I mean, almost like think about if you know tomorrow you're going to get hit with ransomware, plan out what would we do and have a plan for that. If you haven't done that exercise, it would make sense for you to do that at some point in the near future. 
Absolutely, yeah. And if you think about, you know, the way schools do perform fire drills, right? How do, how do students know how to exit the building, where they're supposed to go? Perform a cybersecurity fire drill. Recover from backups. Take a look at, you know, what would happen if this particular system was, was offline for four hours, for 12 hours, for, for a week, right? What would that mean? How could we prevent that from happening? Um, another question that just came in through the panel was, is there anything we can do on existing Cisco switches or is buying services the only way to harden the LAN and the WAN? Okay, I can take this one. Um, so first off, with existing Cisco switches, um, from a security perspective, there are the, some of the technologies we talked about are capabilities within those switches. So StealthWatch, for example, leverages NetFlow. So you're turning those switches into detection points so you just, it's enabling NetFlow and detecting that. That's different from like solar winds or from like a, a performance NetFlow because that's just looking for devices being overutilized. But that's the first way to leverage that investment. The second one is, is like using like 802.1x, that's access control. So that's turning those switches into access points that also do profiling. So now you can do the segmentation there. But beyond buying those technologies, general port security and general segmentation are things you might want to do. Uh, again, you know, VLAN and ACL type stuff where students don't just have access to everything. So by, by putting in segmentation, at least if you have to segment off your data center and segment off certain things, those are things you can do to harden your, your switching environment. Um, port security, obviously, again, is one, but in the student environment could be challenging depending on um, your, your guest access policies or your wireless policy. But uh, access control is always an important one, so people can't just plug stuff in. And then uh, in general, uh, we do have, uh, I believe, we can uh, pull this up, there are some security best practices for switches, like certain capabilities you can turn on, et cetera. So there are some of that, but particularly for ransomware, we're going to recommend NetFlow, we're going to recommend automated access control, which will be like ICE and uh, StealthWatch, those as being two tools that leverage that, that investment. Very good. Yep. We also have another one. Uh... What kinds of systems should be segmented from each other, HVAC, security cameras, et cetera, and should those segments flow through a layer three switch or, or a security gateway? So it, it depends. I mean, a lot of people, when they get into uh, segmentation, the recommendation is always crawl, walk, run. Uh, it's very rare that somebody comes up and says, hey, I'm going to do 40 different layers of segmentation. That becomes extremely challenging. In my experience of deploying uh, access control technologies and doing that, we typically keep it simple. So we start with a policy of first employees from guests. Uh, we just start there. So employees end up here, guests don't. You can use Active Directory uh, to do that. And then the next layer is usually like BYOD, where it's like people with iPads and iPhones typically don't need access to like the data center. So we segment those in, in a segment as well. And then you may have things like you're talking about like printers or HVAC or card readers where you may put those in a segment. You may do your, your, v, your voice traffic on a separate segment through your uh, auxiliary VLAN and all that. So you may grow into that per se. Uh, and that's really it's industry by industry type stuff. Um, there really isn't like a, hey, this is the way to do your segmentation per se. But we will say that in general best practices, your sensitive servers and all that should be, but by all means, uh, least privilege. And least privilege means only provide access and the necessary access to the people who have access to, uh, to it. So if you don't need access, don't grant access. It's the firewall method, uh, method. It's the least privilege versus open privilege. If you have that approach and then you segment your data center, you're, you're doing the right step. Yeah, yeah, that least privilege principle is really key to, key to keep in mind. And, and by doing that, in a lot of ways, you're going to answer your own questions because, you know, you as the administrators and, and IT and security staff of that school, you know which systems should and shouldn't be allowed to, to talk to each other. Uh, one other question that Correct. came up is um, just sort of a general question about uh, this person has, has heard about Cisco Talos. They're not really sure sort of what that is. Is there anything that that you could sort of mention about Cisco Talos and how they may sort of fit into this discussion at all? Sure, I can talk about Talos. Uh, on the last point, on the last question, by the way, once you develop your segmentation, one last key to think about is uh, put monitoring probes in place. It's very popular to do that, meaning that like if this is your sensitive network, 
then you want to monitor whether you're using like a stealth watch or some other tool. So if unauthorized people or something gets there, you, you alert to it right away. So segmentation actually really helps the incident response program. I want to point that out. Absolutely. So the Talos question, um, the best place to learn about Talos first off is check out their blog. So if you check out the Talos, I think it's Talos at Intel, uh, if one of the uh, monitors can find the blog and post it in the chat. Uh, but the Talos blog is a great place to start. What is Talos? Uh, if you look at companies, a lot of times they'll say they have research groups, but really it's like a sales guy that also is uh, being added to that number. We at Cisco have a real research group. It's made up of a few hundred people that just do research. They're the ones that power our products. So if you didn't have Talos, for example, that router would be a metal box. Like the signatures, the subscriptions, the snort rules, all that kind of stuff that, that gets sent to it comes from Talos. So they're our security research group. They also have people, like there's a guy I met, I, I, I was actually spent a week at what we call the residency program um, a few months back. There's like one guy, for example, that all he does is exploit kicks. And literally, like I was, he was showing me all sorts of stuff. And there's a matrix, you see the, the, uh, the weird code, and he's like blonde, brunette, brunette uh, redhead. He's like, that's rigged, that's, these guys are in China, these guys, these guys are in Ukraine, that's all this person does. So you've got these heavy research guys that are researching this stuff, they're seeing like 10,000 samples of malware a day and, and ransomware a day. So they're putting it inside a threat grid sandbox uh, uh, and uh, basically analyzing this, looking at the trends, and then trying to adapt our products as well as industry just kind of educate. So you'll see them at like major conferences, you'll see on the blog post innovations, that, that uh, RAN scam thing, that was their research. Angular we talked about, that was their research, and they actually took down Angular for a little bit. And they're back up, but they, they – the whole idea is it's cat and mouse. They made it really cost uh, prohibitive for Angular for a period of time because they took down certain servers. So uh, they definitely they do a lot in the industry, and there's, there's definitely a whole hour to be dedicated to learning about Talos. But the short answer is they're the gasoline for our products. They do that as well as they do other, other security research. And definitely check out that blog. You can learn a lot around, like, there's many ransomware posts. They got it around exploit kits. Uh, Sam, Sam, every version of ransomware that's, that's very current via email, you probably can find research from them on that blog. Great. A uh, couple Other more questions, questions about sure. um, just sort of general, general information about uh, segmentation of access devices, um, more about Cisco services. I mean, a, a lot of this, we obviously don't have time to go through all of the questions, and these are some really, really great, great questions. You know, sort of our, our closing piece will we'll just remind everyone, you know, to reach out to your Cisco account teams, your Cisco security account teams um, for, for more detailed discussions, right? There's really a, a wide range of security resources um, that, that Cisco can, can help you bring to bear to protect and secure your, your K-12 environment. Um, maybe just as sort of one last question, um, you know, how could we educate uh, this is a really good one, actually. How do you educate students and teachers uh, about ransomware? Okay. Well, um, think about the attack. The attack is, it's not really necessarily understanding ransomware as much as understanding how it gets on the computer. That's what's key. So the, the key for you is to make your network more secure is not having your users exposing you to these attacks. Because again, the idea is, is the bad guys are going to try to figure out a way to get your users to go to what's called a landing page. And then at that point, the, the attack becomes automated. They, they find vulnerabilities, and that's, that's more on you. So let's say the two things that your users can do is, one, the education on patch management. So if software says, update me, then the user should update it. If the Java says, update me, that's important. So whether it's a memo or a note or something around updates, not so Joey, it sounds like we're we're losing a little bit of your audio. Oh, okay. Do I sound better now? Yep. Good. 
Um, we at Cisco, what we do is we do phishing campaigns. And you can make it as simple as shoot out an email and just copy and paste an example of something and say, students, don't click everything. They, uh, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Here's an example of, a, of an email. You can just do it like that. You can actually use like fishme.com, which we use, where the email itself is a real phishing attack. And when you click it, a pop-up comes up and says, uh, this would have done bad stuff. In the future, please check for these things and all that. So there's different uh, levels of, of options to educate. There's the paid options, and we can talk to the Cisco account team. We can give you advice on that. Or there's the, the, the cheap or, or free way, which is just taking some screenshots, and you can Google uh, phishing email examples and just explain to your students, warning email, look out for where you click, look out what you do, because uh, the site you go to could be malicious in nature. Those are some of the education things, but the clicking understanding of things and the patching, people, if, you're not, if students are doing it themselves, explaining the importance of patching, those would be two points I would focus on a, either a webinar or, or email or announcements to try to get students to be aware of. Great. Well, that, uh, that just about does it for today. So I uh, want to thank everyone for, for joining us. Um, thanks, my thanks to Joey for providing such a, a detailed explanation of, of ransomware and how you can protect your education, uh, educational environment against these types of risks. If you have any further questions, if you want to have a discussion about this in more detail, please reach out to your Cisco account teams. Please reach out to your, your Cisco security account teams. And uh, honestly, we, we really look forward to um, just sitting down with you and, and having a discussion about this in, in more detail. Bethany? Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's webcast. As a reminder, a very short survey will pop up when you close your browser following the show. Have a great day.